HCAM News is supported by our viewers and by Hopkinton Drug, located in this historic New England town since 1954. They are a multifaceted store dedicated to providing clients with an array of health care options. And by Webster First Federal Credit Union, providing financial products with attentive customer service to the local families and businesses of Hopkinton. Visit us at WebsterFirst.com. Welcome to HCAM News, Tom Nappy at the Anchor Desk to keep you up to date with everything you need to know about Hopkinton. On this edition of HCAM News, I talked with school committee candidate Brian Karp. Jeff Doherty of Angels Garden Center talks about overcoming a brutal winter, and we have Hopkinton Hiller's baseball highlights. But first, during the first week of May, it was town meeting time in Hopkinton, and on day one, Weed control and Lake Maspinock was the big debate. Secondary amendments to start this process off so that you can vote on the main amendment. In day one of the town meeting, the big debate was if pesticides should be used for treating weeds in Lake Maspinock. During the discussion over Article 8, the fiscal 2016 operating budget, treatment of the lake was debated. Most were against using pesticides or chemicals to treat the weeds in the lake. In the 1970s, the lake was treated with herbicides. Residents remember the summer when all the fish died and the lake was surrounded by signs stating it was unsafe to swim in the lake. We do not want this to happen again. I would like to propose that the town, under the auspices of the committees they deem appropriate, create a committee to study all the alternatives for weed control on Lake Maspinot and the other lakes within Hopkinton. These are precious resources, and we need to make sure that whatever we do will protect these resources for future generations. Um, it would be good if we did something with this, it's constructive. The big problem is the lake is full of muck that is loaded with nutrients. That needs to go, otherwise we will always have weeds. We could have algal blooms. An algal bloom happened in Indian Lake in Worcester this last year. They called the DCR. Because you get blue-green algae, some of it puts out neurotoxins. The DCR shut the lake down for the rest of the year. We have a lake that's a big pot full of lots of different plant materials. You throw something in, you kill things, you stir it up the pot, who knows what happens next, but something will happen. We need to stop the addition of nutrients to the lake at the source. And if you look around the room, we are the source. And I think that we don't want to be spending the taxpayer of Hopkinton's money on treating with chemicals when we need rather to do an education of all the things that we Lake residents need to do to change our behavior, to stop putting fertilizer on our lawns, um, and to stop adding to the problem. Because if we use herbicides and we kill the weeds that are in there, they sink to the bottom of the lake and add to the nutrients. And the next summer we add more herbicides and so on. Some were for the use of pesticides. I was extremely apprehensive. I have two young children that live in this lake all summer long. Um, but I kept an open mind and we did a lot of research and we um, asked, went around to a lot of lake associations that have done this in the past and have done this for years. The herbicides we're using have been around for decades. Um, there's a lot of research on them. I think when people look at the side effects, which is what I did at first, you're looking at a label on the actual bottle. But when diluted parts per million in our lake, and it's spot treated. They're not dumping barrels of this on the lake and saying go at it. You know, they spot treat these, the heaviest areas. Uh, we're primarily an association made up of uh, lakefront residents. Uh, however, we do have uh, many members uh, from other parts of town who enjoy Sandy Beach as well as the other recreational uh, resources that uh, Lake Maspinock provides. This is our problem. This is actual pictures from last summer in the North Basin in Lake Maspinock. The weeds have become uh, overabundant. We have uh, residents that are removing literally uh, barrels of, uh, and wheelbarrows full of, of lake weeds on a regular basis. Um, now, natural aquatic uh, vegetation is uh, uh, an important part of any lake ecosystem, but when it becomes overabundant like it is today in Lake Maspinock, 
it, uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous not only for the recreational use, as you heard earlier, but it's also dangerous in terms of the life of the lake. Eutrophication, uh, or the life cycle of a lake, is actually accelerated as weed, uh, weed growth is left unchecked. You can be killed with diquad. If you are exposed to extreme, if you're dipped in it, yes, it's exposed. What's going to happen is a treatment in very small particles into the lake. As a boat goes through, it's down low. Within one day, it's all dissipated. In the end, amendments giving the Board of Selectmen control over weed treatment and $60,000 going towards lake treatment without the use of pesticides won the majority. Treating the lake without pesticides won a standing vote 150 to 90. On day two, Article 8, the fiscal 2016 operating budget talks continued. The budget was approved after an amended deduction of $60,000 towards an assistant town manager position was cut out. The fiscal 2016 operating budget was approved at about $72.4 million. Also on day two, town meeting approved a new $14.1 million Department of Public Works facility. Towards the beginning of day three, the big debate was whether to allow legacy farms to convert 200,000 square feet of commercially zoned space on the north side to 180 age-restricted housing units. On day three, the long-awaited debate over Article 30 took place. The total time spent on Article 30 lasted about an hour and a half. If passed, the article would allow legacy farms to replace 200,000 square feet of commercial space on the north side with 180 age-restricted housing units. Roy McDowell of Legacy Farms started off with a presentation giving the specifics of the zoning change. Again, this is a summary of the benefits we talked about. Less school-aged children, town-wide trail network, downtown capital improvements, reduced traffic. So when one looks at it and says, well, gee, we'd like the commercial up there, is it zoned commercial? Yes, it is. Could we build it? Yes, we can. But we think it's a better fit for the community as a whole. It's a better fit for the development, traffic-wise, revenue-wise, and the general appearance of that particular section of town to have this, and uh, we look forward to your support. Many were for this, and some felt it is a better area of land for housing units over commercial space. I sat back and removed myself from the situation and looked at it from a more um, town planning perspective. And I had a bit of an aha moment. And my aha moment is, why would we put a commercial development near our state park and far away from major roads? The look of it is not gonna be the commercial, but rather a res residential. And um, in terms of the school children, I work in the schools and I know that we are trying to figure out where to put another school because of the increase in uh, children. So while I love children, I think it is probably um, a better thing to not have that additional um, population increase there and appreciate that the, um, that the, the condo association would put in 9,000 if there were um, children that, that came along with the uh, over 55. Um, the other thing I think is if less industry to me means less industrial waste. Some were against and felt the commercial space would be more beneficial to the town. A year later, where are we? We've got the, in my view, the challenge before us is to better manage our growth that we're facing now, not to add to it. So some main reasons I'd like to suggest to vote no this evening. We voted for the Osmud um, years ago for this, the biggest project to hit the town. That's the Osmud stands for Open Space Mixed Use Development. With the permanent elimination of half of the commercial square footage that we uh, voted for at that time, it's almost like it's becoming a major residential development. So that's right off the bat, it's, this seems to be changing the will of what we approved with years of planning and debate and a huge town meeting vote. So just wanted to mention that. Secondly, we need to really fully, re fully realize the public benefits that we have already had in the arrangement. All the towns east of us 
have grown. We can't support that density. We are not on the Quabbin Reservoir. We're not an MWR8 town. All of our water comes from local wells, public and private. I'm not convinced that 180 homes on 20 acres is sustainable use of our aquifer. Perhaps the most controversial part of the Article 30 debate was the standing count. It took three times to get the final tally. It failed the required two-thirds majority in the first count, with 82 against, 157 for. Then a second count took place, and Article 30 passed with 166 for, and 82 against. Then a third count was asked for, and there was 171 for, and 85 against. The article passed the required two-thirds majority by one single vote. To see all the happenings of town meeting, check out our town meeting update pages on our website, hcam.tv. Now that town meeting is over, attention can be turned to election season. The only contested races this year are parks and recreation as well as school committee. Recently, I sat down with school committee candidate Brian Carp. I'm here with school committee candidate Brian Carp. Brian, thanks for joining us on HCAM News. Nice to be here, Tom. Thanks. Uh, can you talk about some of your um, background information and things you've done in the community? Absolutely. Uh, we moved here uh, back in 2005, and shortly after that, I got involved with Girl Scouts. I've got two young I had two young daughters. Uh, so I got involved with Girl Scouts then and eventually became a co-leader. Through that I made a lot of connections and joined the HPTA. Uh, at my time in the HPTA I served as the Elmwood Art Room Volunteer Coordinator. Uh, after that I got into politics. I uh, was appointed a member of Zoning Advisory Committee, served on Zoning Advisory Committee for two years, and for the last four years I've been on Planning Board. So what made you want to run for school committee? There were a few things that made me run for, want to run for school committee. First thing was um, when I first saw the budget, come, the proposed budget come out and I saw five and a quarter percent, I said that seems a little high and I wanted to look into that. So I started doing some investigation. Shortly after that, there was uh, the school calendar issue. And that's what, decided me, that's what made me decide to get, pull my papers. I pulled my papers, got my signatures, turned them in, and I was still a little bit on the fence, but the more I thought about it, I said, this is something I really want to do. And I've put my whole heart into it. So what are your goals if elected to the school committee? So if elected to school committee, what I'd like to do is I'd like to change the format of the way the meetings are held. Right now, the way meetings are held, there's a portion of the meeting before new business uh, called uh, public comment. And then there's a portion after old business called public comment. Those are the only two times that people get to actually come into the meeting and speak. What I'd like to do is what a lot of, what I'd like to see happen is what happens in a lot of the other uh, committees and boards and departments where it's more of an open welcoming discussion. If we have an open discussion during the meeting, people will be more apt to come to the meetings, people will be more engaged and more interested, and the committee members can actually make a better informed decision. I'd also like to revert back to the traditional holidays. Uh, the, taking away the holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Good Friday creates a lot of stress on families. The children, the students, they need to figure out, do I need to go to school so I don't get behind? And in that, in that situation, they're not practicing their faith, they're not with their families. Do I go to temple, do I go to church and practice my faith with my family? In that case, they're behind in school. So I'd like to get those holidays back. We've had school committees who initiated those holidays in the years past, and they've kept them up, and I think that we need to get them back on the calendar. The other thing that I would do is I would look at the budget. As I said before, I'd look a lot, as I have done, I, I would look closely at the budget and, in, and ask the hard questions. I would ask things to find out why we're spending money this way or why we're proposing money this way. My goal is to get a good school committee, get a good school budget that is fiscally responsible to all the taxpayers in the town.
So what experiences or skills do you bring that you feel will serve to benefit the school committee? Well, what I bring with me, first of all, is I bring a different point of view. It, I bring something that will be not business as usual. I also bring with me good communication skills, good listening skills. People tell me uh, stories, I listen to them, I try to get, I'll, I'll do my best to try to get those situations fixed. I also bring with me a lot of years of public service um, and, and I will continue to do everything that I can to serve the community as best as I possibly can in the way that I have. All right, Brian, well, best of luck at the ballot box on May 18th, and thanks for joining us on HCAM News. Thank you, Tom. We are going to take a short time out on HCAM News. Coming up next, Jeff Doherty talked to me about how Angels Garden Center fared through the brutal winter. We have Hiller's baseball highlights, and Courtney will have our HCAM Insider. A lot more on the way. Stay tuned. HCAM programming is supported by our viewers, thank you, and by Golden Pond Assisted Living, honoring resident choice, dignity, and independence. Our health and wellness focus keeps residents active. Golden Pond, state-of-the-art senior housing and health care services. And by WPC Pest Control, a family-owned business for over 35 years. Owners Jim and Rebecca Mazzucchelli provide honesty, respect, and integrity, performing safe and effective pest control services. They service your home like it's their home. Hello, I am Marie Smith, and I am the chairperson of the Hopkinton Women's Club Community Register and Telephone Directory. We hope you have found our little book to be a helpful resource in the past. We are beginning work on the 2016 edition, and we need your help. Every household in Hopkinton receives one of these for free, and we want to make sure you are included. Our residential listings are based on the information we get from Verizon. If you have switched to a different provider, such as Comcast, we may not have your number. If you do not have a landline, we definitely won't have your number. Or maybe you prefer your cell number in our directory. So please take a minute and help us make the directory accurate and useful for everybody. Take a look at the Hopkinton phone book that you have and make any corrections in it. Or if you are new to town, please send us an email before June 30th. We would love to hear from you. Thank you. Welcome back to HCAM News. This past winter was one of the most brutal in recent history throughout the area and led to delays for a lot of businesses getting ready for the spring season. Recently, Jeff Doherty, owner of Angel's Garden Center, talked to me about their struggles overcoming the record amount of snow from this past winter. After a brutal winter, it's been difficult for a lot of businesses to get ready for spring. Jeff Doherty of Angel's Garden Center said things are coming along, but running a bit behind. We're having a real tough time getting Mother Nature to cooperate with our start of spring. We're about four weeks behind. Uh, generally I get bark mulch in the middle of March. Sometimes we even open St. Patrick's Day and we don't look back. But unfortunately this year, similar to last year because we had a cold long winter, um, we've had to reschedule everything and I didn't get bark mulch in until last week and we just opened the doors last Wednesday. Jeff mentioned that due to the current chilly weather, things have been a bit slow. People are not convinced um, because of the weather and the temperature that it's spring out. I think we need a couple of real nice warm sunny days in, in the 60s that will convince them that they can do planting outdoors or at least just get it out in the yard and start doing a cleanup. Um, pansies, violas, all the spring bulbs are all safe to put outside as long as we don't have temperatures that dip below 28 degrees. I asked Jeff what product have people been buying since the weather has been so cold? We've always been known uh, for pansies. I mean my mom and dad when they started the business 60 years ago planted pansies in the ground in the fall and we actually hand dug pansies. I did it as a kid 
and we put them in little baskets, little wooden baskets called tills. And we used to sell our first crop of the year, which were hardy pansies, for 50 cents for a till of six plants. Um, things have changed considerably since then. And uh, we still start our five season with pansies because they just love the cold. They do well in the cold, and once temperatures kick up in May, then they start to peter out. Now a couple glimpses of warm weather so far uh, in this winter slash spring, whatever you want to call it right now. Uh, has it gotten you excited for the season to come, which will hopefully be soon? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we've, we've been on edge just waiting for, you know, a nice warm sunny day so that when people do come in, we have a lot of nice products for them to look at. We have new hanging baskets. We already have some herbs out. Uh, we have our pansies and violas. We have a lot of perennials that we're starting to put out now. So there's gonna be a nice mix of things for people coming in. Uh, we had a real strong Easter and Passover holiday. Um, that worked out well for us. We, had a, we saw a lot of people that we haven't seen for a year. So it's been a real nice start to uh, the spring. After four road games to start off the season, the Hillers baseball team had a full week of games on their home field, and it started off in exciting fashion against Ashland. Monday, April 27th, Hopkinton took on Ashland. Ashland scored on the top of the first, one and nothing clockers entering the bottom of the second. Cal Holland crushes one to center field. It falls out of the glove of outfielder Nick Boselli to score Drew Donahue. It's going to fall out of the glove of Boselli. Rounding third now is Donahue. He is going to come home, and Holland's going to slide into third. Then Evan Park does this. On the ground, up the middle, that'll get through for a hit, and another Hillers run will score. It's a two to one game off an Evan Park single. The very next half inning, Hopkinton up two to one. Ashland responded. Ronan Bates sacrifices for one. Then a pass ball makes it three to two Ashland. By the catcher and a run is going to come across for Ashland. But no fear, Calvin Holland is here. Bottom of the fourth. Hit in the air towards left field. This one was crushed. And back towards the fence. That ball's gone. A home run for Calvin Holland. Still tied at three, entering the bottom of the seventh. One out, Drew Simi at the plate. Wind up and the pitch. As outside, gets by the catcher, Bates, and the runner takes off, he gets into third, and then it's thrown into the outfield, and the run will score, and the Hopkinton Hillers walk off with the four to three victory. Mike Messier. The Hillers walk off with the four to three win over Ashland. Evan Park goes the complete game, giving up three runs on four hits, striking out 10. Cal Holland went one for one at the plate with a walk and the home run. Wednesday, April 29th, the Hillers took on Dover Sherborne. DS up one to nothing, Slowinski hits the ball off of Matt Decina and it goes into the outfield. Two run score, three to nothing, Dover Sherborne. Five to two, Dover Sherborne in the bottom of the seventh. Mike Messier drives in a run, but that is all the Hillers got as they fall to Dover Sherborne, five to three. Owen Webb and Greg Holler both went the complete game. Webb gave up three runs on six hits and had three Ks. Friday, May 1st was Little League Day at the ballpark as the Hillers battled Medfield. Unfortunately for the Hillers, things did not go so well. Top of the sixth, Medfield leading 10 to two. With one out in the inning, George Sawan did this. Zane gets the sign and deals, and this is hit in the air towards left field, going towards the fence, that's off the fence and gone. A solo shot. George Sawan goes yard, it's 11 to two, Medfield. Medfield improves to six and two. The Hillers fall to three and four as they lose to the Warriors, 11 to two. Medfield pitcher Ryan Schwar went the complete game, giving up two runs on one hit and striking out eight. Be sure to be on the lookout for Hiller's softball and baseball airing on HCAM. 
For more information about the wide array of programs coming up on the HCAM channels, here is our promotions coordinator, Courtney, with our HCAM Insider. Hello everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the HCAM Insider. This week we have Baseball vs. Medfield airing on Saturday, May 9th at 1.30pm. The game will then replay all throughout the week on HCAM Ed. Visit hcam.tv slash education for playback dates and times. In a new Wake Up and Smell the Poetry, on Monday, May 11th at 7pm, Ruth Edmonds Hill shares stories of women of courage. Now, one person was Grace Hopper. She was a computer pioneer, and she began as a midshipman in the waves, and when she retired, she was a rear admiral. But she was inventor of a COBOL computer language. On Thursday, May 14th at 4.30 p.m., Marjorie Thompson appears in the studio to share her music in her final studio session live performance. Well, let her go, let her go, God bless her. At 7 p.m., the school committee meeting will air live on HCAM TV. The meeting can also be viewed on our live stream at hcam.tv slash live. On Sunday, May 17th at 10 a.m., the planning board meeting from May 11th will air. And on HCAM Ed, watch and listen as high school students rock out in Battle of the Bands. Would you like to sign up to receive the HCAM Insider newsletter? If so, all you have to do is send me an email at Courtney at hcam.tv. If you do receive it, then please pass it along and help us grow. As always, thanks for watching HCAM. Now back to you, Tom. Thank you, Courtney. That will wrap up this edition of HCAM News. Be sure to check our website, hcam.tv, or find us on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date with everything Hopkinton including town meeting happenings and upcoming local events. If you have a Hopkinton-related video, photo, or story idea, I want to hear from you. Email me at news at hcam.tv. With your help, we'll cover even more of our community. For everyone here at HCAM, I'm Tom Nappy. We leave you now with the current community listings and upcoming government meetings. Take care and be well.